Welcome to AJFF In Conversation, the Jewish Film Podcast. I am your host, Brad Pilcher. I am also the Associate Director of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, which is exactly what we have gathered here to talk about today. It has been, by almost every measure, one of the strangest, most difficult years in AJFF's two-plus decades. We successfully navigated the first year of the pandemic. We launched a virtual festival to audience accolades. And 2022 was supposed to be the year that we put the pandemic behind us and returned to theaters. It's still early in calendar 2022, but at least as far as the annual festival is concerned, that didn't quite work out. And yet here we are, a week out from the 22nd annual AJFF, and we've got what may be one of the best lineups we've ever had. We've improved the virtual cinema, the festival will go on, and it is poised to be a great one. I am joined by Kenny Blank, our executive director, and Sari Earl, our board president. They're going to help me sort through all of the weirdness and whiplash and wonder that will ultimately be the 2022 Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. Sari, Kenny, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Brad, great to be back on for the relaunch of AJFF and Conversation. I want to start with you, Kenny, because you and I have worked together on this festival for 15 years. I did the math uh, earlier. I was in my mid-20s when I first joined the team, and you've been the executive director for, I think, 18 years, 19 years. How do you feel about this year when you stack it up against all of those years that came before it? Because it's a very different year than all those years. Well, Brad, as you said, we've been on this journey together for a long time, and every year the festival there's always war stories behind the scenes about things that didn't go as expected or some wonderful spontaneous moment that was more magical than anyone could have uh, dreamed for the festival. But nothing prepared us for what uh, has occurred over these past two years. I think that uh, special pandemic edition of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival in 2021, which you're right, I think we pulled off beautifully Probably in all of our minds, uh, our professional team and our board leadership, Sari, and uh, even our audience probably expected that was going to be a one and done and we'd be snapping right back to normal uh, this year or something much closer to normal. And uh, the ups and downs of COVID uh, have thrown us for some some curveballs, to be sure. So it is another strange year, uh, but I think the festival, once again, will rise to meet the moment and meet audiences where they're at. And we've done the right thing. I'm convinced we have done the right thing by making this pivot to virtual, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. It was a hard decision, but um, we have to be responsive to the to the times we're in. Barry, you became the first woman president of AJFF kind of as this pandemic was was kicking our butt. And, and you had the same hopes, I think, that we all had of going and making this the year we put it behind us. I mean, how do you feel? What were your hopes kind of coming in and how do you feel about how it's all played out? Well, I had so many great plans. I mean, I was so proud to be the first woman president of the organization. I had all these great plans for different women's organizations to come together, bring in female directors. I mean, the staff is so good and our festival is so amazing and the contacts and the networks we have here, local filming uh, community and I was just so excited for it. So big adjustment to um, to essentially dealing with the fact that we would have to be finding new ways to connect with each other because we couldn't do it as much in person as we had hoped. Um, on the flip side, there's one thing that I love that came out of all of this is that my father had ALS and was handicapped. And so I've always been very sensitive to accessibility and inclusivity uh, issues, uh, getting through doorways, getting into buildings, um, being able to experience things that other people get to experience um, who don't have limitations. So last year when we did the virtual streaming, I loved it. And I, I really promised myself in my, in my heart that this is something that we should always offer because we do have so many audience members who we can reach that otherwise wouldn't necessarily have made it into the theater. So I like to look at the positive things that have come out of it. Definitely the streaming opportunity is fantastic. I definitely watched more movies last year and I will watch even more movies this year because it's so easy and because I can do it at home. And because in years past, um, sometimes my husband would wanna leave before the Q and A 
and I would want to stay. And now I, we don't have that issue anymore. I, I can watch any q and I want, whatever I want, and he can watch uh, whichever he chooses. So I see a lot of positives coming out of it. Um, the other thing that's been positive out of it is the relationship building. This has been such a challenging year, and we have had such a roller coaster of emotions, experiences, expectations, uh, planning, budgeting, um, that I feel like we had to engage with each other. And I'm talking board, volunteers, staff, our amazing donors, at a very human level, just very frankly and honestly speaking with each other about what we've been going through personally and how we can bring the best festival possible together um, that would be safe and also something that we would be really proud of. And I'm really proud of the staff. I'm so proud of the volunteers and our donors. And I, I'm almost crying. I've been so touched by our supporters and how much what we do has made an imprint on their lives and how much they appreciate us for the work that we do. I think that's actually one of the things that people don't realize Obviously, the decision to to pivot to an on, all virtual festival after the program guide had gone to print, you know, after we'd already, you know, booked some of these venues and we had all these plans in place, that was obviously a major choice. And I don't think anybody assumes that we just sort of made that choice flippantly. But the amount of conversation that went into that decision and the amount of time that we spent very thoroughly sitting down with our medical and scientific advisors and then sitting down with our staff and then sitting down with our board and then coming back and having more conversations with our board and having follow-up conversations with experts who were scientific experts, medical experts, but also ethicists and other people who could just sort of help us understand what the impact would be of this choice and to try to make the choice as thoughtfully as possible it was, you know, it was astounding. I'm sure it was exhausting for, for the staff probably to have to go through all of that work, but it was really necessary. And I don't know that people realize just how much went into just that part of the process, just coming to the choice to, to, to make that decision. Yeah, Brad, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I'd, I'd take a step even further back and just look at the full year of planning that goes into the festival. I don't know that listeners would or should understand all of the components that go into planning a film festival, even in a normal year. We are pre-screening films and selecting uh, film entries starting way back in the summer, uh, in, in May and June, all the way through November. We're out fundraising, we're developing the marketing materials, we're putting a, a beautifully produced uh, program guide uh, off uh, to print and to press. All of the guest speaker curation that has to happen, the engagement with volunteers. It's a, it's a massive undertaking, complex, and even in normal times, uh, the lead time that that requires. Now, trying to compress all of that decision-making around the festival experience due to COVID considerations, compressing that into a much shorter time frame, where you're kind of moving forward in two tracks. Are we going to be in person? Are we going to be virtual? Or is it going to be some hybrid of both? sort of gaming out all those different scenarios and then having to make that ultimate decision. Um, it was, it was challenging for the staff, for the board. Our audience has been incredibly patient and in understanding we received nothing but, you know, just heartfelt support and appreciation from our funders and audience in response to this decision. Look, as you, as you alluded to, Brad, no one wants to be back in theaters more than this festival team. This is why we got into the business of Film festivals, we feed off that energy of being in the theater with our audience and seeing their reactions to these films, how they come out of the theaters transformed and impacted by these movies. That's what fuels our work. So we miss not being able to see that and have that uh, connection. Um, but we know, as Sari said, how the experience has changed. It's just different. It's not better or worse. It's just going to be different. And there's certainly ways that we have strived to retain that sense of community connection, dialogue and conversation that happens around the festival. I found the process that we put in place over a year ago, we created the COVID task force to really figure out, first of all, funding, second of all, how we operate. Third, how do we support our staff? How do we support our community? It was a really smart move. We didn't anticipate the COVID task force lasting as long as it has. But boy, has it made a difference um, and elevated the conversation 
to include people all sitting around the table, staff, uh, volunteers, in a way that allowed it to be open uh, and let people really speak from their heart as to what they were going through and what we thought would be the best way to put on the best possible festival we could. And it was a pretty fantastic uh, conversation, sometimes some very challenging conversations, but I do feel like our process was so healthy that at the end of the day, there was such genuine uniformity. Everybody really came to it in a, in a beautiful way. I feel like we have the best board uh, of any organization I've ever volunteered with. And our board is so unique in that we say anything we feel, we speak very openly, we uh, counter and recounter and uh, put things forth. But at the end of the day, we really do tend to come to consensus. And that is very unique for a board and, um, and everybody really supports the staff. So for me, the whole process, as long as it took and what was involved was not painful. It was uh, healthy. And I was um, just glad to be in the same boat with the crew that we have. Yeah, it was definitely a process that, you know, it was a thorough, methodical process. I, I think for the staff, I think they had the same feelings. I think, you know, I, Kenny, we all kind of sat back and thought, we're very proud of the fact that we're being thoughtful. We're very proud of the fact that we are talking to people who know better than we do the science um, or some of the other issues. But, you know, it was also equally challenging for us because we were planning for the in-person festival right up until, you know, we had to make the final decision We because we had to, because there, as Kenny, you know, mentioned, there's so much that goes into it. So we were kind of doing the work twice over. Um, and that is one of the things that I think people... I don't know if they understand just how much complexity goes into an all virtual festival, how much complexity goes into an, a hybrid festival an in-person festival last year was, should have been harder, right? Because last year was the first year we, we had to deal with this. It was the first year of the pandemic and we had to figure out how to do a virtual festival. We had never done that before. So that really should have been so much harder, but this year felt harder because we, we were hoping and we were trying to get back to in person and we were planning for that right up until, you know, essentially the middle end of January when we made the decision, we knew there was a possibility we would have to cancel the in-person, but we still had to plan for it because that was our plan. And to have to do all of that work kind of twice to have to figure out how to communicate the pivot in a way that wasn't confusing to people. And I hope that we've been successful in that regard it made this year actually feel somewhat harder, I think, than last year. I don't know about you, Kenny. Yeah, Brad, I think all the things you're speaking to, to me, really highlight the strength of this organization, um, really since its inception, that it has been a film festival that belongs to this community, that is informed by incredible community perspectives from some of the best and brightest minds uh, in our Atlanta community, and they come from all sectors of life uh, on our board of directors from uh, the film industry, media, uh, the business community, the cultural community, the religious community. And this is something the audience often doesn't see, this incredible board leadership we have, the volunteers on all of our planning committees. I mean, they are really the ones who are helping inform a lot of these decisions. It's important to have that community perspective because this festival is ultimately here to serve our, our Jewish Atlanta community, our film loving community, uh, the larger community. So just having those perspectives um, is important part of the decision making process. Um, our professional team certainly ultimately owns these decisions and carries them forward. But I think it's ha important having those other voices in the room. And during COVID times, that has included, as you've said, our medical advisory group, which again, our audience may not have a full awareness or appreciation, we had some of the best medical and scientific minds really helping guide us through these past two years, uh, including representatives of the CDC, uh, Children's Healthcare, um, Piedmont Hospital, and they were just very thoughtful and really had the community interest in mind. I mean, they kept coming back to again and again, priority, safety, number one, how do we protect your festival audience? but also our larger community, our healthcare workers on the front lines, uh, anyone who's impacted by, by this uh, pandemic, which is, which is all of us, and really looking at it in true spirit of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, 
with the larger community interest um, front of mind. Barry, I got to ask you a question because Kenny and I are staff. So every day we get up, we, you know, we don't drive into the office, we log onto our computers, but every day we're sweating all the logistical details and every little programmatic wrinkle. You're part of the leadership team with us, but you are not having to do all of that granular work every day. This is not your job. You're a part of the audience. And so I'm, I'm curious because for me, as challenging as it was for us as a staff, as us, as a, as a board, it was, I'm sure, frustrating for the audience to to not know what we were going to do and then to also sort of expect us to come back in person. I know there were a lot of individuals who are comfortable going out. Their, their risk profile is different. You know, their comfort level with going into a theater is different than everybody else's. So they're like, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm ready to go back into a theater right now. And I want to be there. And we were very cognizant of the fact that there was no choice that we could make it was going to make everybody happy. There were going to be some people who were like, what are you doing if we went back into a theater? And there were going to be some people who were going, why aren't you back in a theater if we weren't? Um, I mean, I'm curious in your conversations and, and even just your own personal feelings of having to balance that individual desire, that individual risk comfort level with what we felt was our larger obligation to the whole community to what are we doing to contribute or not contribute to community spread? What are we doing to try to take some of the pressure off the hospitals? I mean, that's where we were looking at it, but you know, individual members of the audience are going to feel different ways. How do you, how do how did you deal with that struggle? Well, it definitely was a struggle. Um, I mean, I have a great dress for opening night. I mean, I had, I was ready to be back in person in our favorite venues with our favorite people really experiencing the festival uh, full on as much as we could. And yet it was a little bit um, challenging. One of the other challenging pieces that aligns with this is when we're fundraising, we are a nonprofit and we have a fiduciary duty to uh, maintain the integrity of our, of our budget and we had to have multiple budgets going simultaneously on the staff side, which, by the way, was brilliant um, and really well done by you, Brad, and the whole team. But having, having that go on, and then I, I did a lot of fundraising. And on those fundraising calls, people would ask me, what are my benefits? Am I going? And, and it, was, it was challenging. They wanted to know, am I going to have all access? Am I going to have you know, the fast pass? Things that we've had in the past. And it, they were challenging conversations because the tight timeline we had, and ultimately, thank goodness, most of our donors are really in this for the philanthropic experience. They love the films, as do I. They love um, having opportunities to uh, rub shoulders with directors and actors and writers and the real sexy side of our film festival. Um, but they also uh, understand that this is a philanthropic endeavor. So at the end of the day, I had a lot of questions about what my benefits would be. And we gave the best answers we could in the time that we could. And thank goodness, our donors came back with this is a philanthropic gift. We understand, you know, where you come to where you need to for us and for our safety. Um, but yeah, it was tough. It was tough for fundraising. It was tough for audience expectations. Um, but I got to say, our Atlanta community really is amazing. They get it. They just get it. And it's and it's a beautiful thing. I hope so. I mean, that's the, always the, the, the hard part for us is because the proof's in the pudding and the pudding doesn't really show up until the festival starts. And I know that for us, as Kenny said, we feed off that energy. We spend a whole year every year planning the festival. We get to the festival and we don't know exactly which films are going to be the most popular. One of the things that Kenny and I do every year is a pastime. It's just sort of day by day tracking the audience award voting and seeing which films um, are performing you know, better than we thought, which films were surprised by how the audience reacted to. And that's something that that I will miss, I think, most of all this year is just not having that sense of immediate feedback from the audience in person in front of you. I don't know, Kenny, what part of the festival you'll miss the most, but uh, that for me is, is we've tried to recreate it with virtual lobbies, things like that. But, you know, it's just there's something about being in the lobby, being in person that you can't re replicate. Well, I just go back to what I said earlier. I think it's a different experience, not necessarily one is um, better or worse. I think, to your point, the most challenging part of pivoting to virtual is recreating that sense of community connection, of 
dialogue and conversation that is such has always been such an important part of our festival, any film festival. It's not just another night at the movies watching a film. It's all of the great, the great socializing and and seeing your fellow audience members uh, having this great visceral experience and then unpacking these films afterwards. But look, we have found uh, really thanks to technology and new tools, all kinds of great new ways to continue that dialogue. Um, I'm thrilled to see we have a record number of filmmakers participating in the festival this year via the uh, pre-recorded Q and A's. Thanks to Zoom and virtual, we can now beam filmmakers into the festival from anywhere in the world. They don't have to hop on a plane and travel to Atlanta to be here with us and connect with our audience. So we have 18 films this year, more than half of the lineup that will have featured curated conversations with the film artists who made these movies. That is a huge upside of, of virtual. Uh, we've relaunched these virtual lobby conversations, which is a chance to take some of the more provocative films of the festival and uh, not have a formal Q&A panel, but really have audience members dialogue with each other, with a facilitator, and go, go deeper on some of these movies that are really buzzworthy and are gonna, you're going to want to talk about uh, after the festival. So yeah, all kinds of unique opportunities with virtual, I think, Sari alluded to this earlier, it's really about access and flexibility. Yes, you wanna plan your festival viewing, but you really can be spontaneous. You can watch movies first thing in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, pack in a bunch of films in one day if that's what your schedule allows. Pause the film and come back to it later if, if you get interrupted. Watch the films in any order that you want. You could be, we like to joke that you can watch the closing night film on opening night and the opening night film on closing night of the festival. People who may have mobility issues, it's not convenient to leave home where the physical venues uh, would not be conducive uh, to travel for you. If you're outside the metro Atlanta, elsewhere in the state of Georgia, all kinds of ways now that we can reach new audiences and audiences can experience more of the festival perhaps now than ever. I think last year we had a first in festival history. We had a moviegoer who reported they were able to watch every single film in the festival lineup for the first time. And that was only possible because of virtual. It was two people. We had two people who watched every single film, including the shorts. I found that astonishing and impressive. And I'm going to give that record a run for its money this year. Take the AJFF challenge. Try to see <laughs> all 40 features in 15 short films. Well, no, I, I to that point of of the challenge of of the of the festival challenge. I mean, I, there is this yearly ritual of everybody gathering around their program guides. I want you to tell the story of that picture that we got sent. I think it was Breadwinner Cafe. There was just a bunch of people with their program guides. Maybe your wife sent it. I don't remember exactly. But tell the story because it, to me, it encapsulates just how, in the face of all the adversity, people are still connecting in, around the film festival and having their program guides out and then figuring out what films they want to watch together and not just sort of alone in their bunkers. Still connecting and, and maybe even more so than ever. People are looking forward to this film festival because it is that one event that community happening that does create a sense of normalcy in what is otherwise completely unfamiliar and strange times. So yes, a lot of the rituals of the festival uh, are things that I, I know our audience is looking forward to and continue to be able to enjoy, such as getting that coveted program guide in your mailbox. And then uh, the story you were telling, uh, my wife was up at uh, Breadwinner in Sandy Springs, walked into the restaurant and there assembled before her was a whole bunch of uh, ladies gathered around with a program guide and their pens out and they were marking which films they planned to see and who they were planning on watching those films with. And that is, that's absolutely part of the joy of the festival. It's, it's the movies for sure. And look, the movies, no matter how we're delivering them, whether you're experiencing them on the big screen or at home with, with a friend, with a family member, the movies themselves are still the core of this festival. And as you said at the top of the show, Brad, better than ever this year as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but yeah, it's all the things that happen around getting ready for the festival, looking at the lineup, kind of curating your own experience for the festival. I think, again, with virtual, there's opportunities to do all kinds of fun things. Cook a meal at home and um, you know, sit down, bring the family together uh, for some movie watching on, on your big screen at home. 
enjoy a cocktail before, during, and, and after the movie, something you can't necessarily do at, at the theater. So yeah, creating all these rituals, you get your favorite popcorn, get your favorite uh, movie candy ready, um, talk to your friends, your family members about what they're planning on seeing, because all of these films now are going to stream during all 12 days of the festival. You can watch any film at any time during the festival footprint. What I'm hoping is going to happen this year, which really has not been possible necessarily to the extent, same extent in the past. You can watch a movie, see something you absolutely love, recommend it to a loved one, a friend, have them go out and they can go watch, then check out that film um, because we're not locked into the traditional screening schedule where if you missed it, you missed it, you missed your shot. Uh, so word of mouth, I think, will really come into play uh, with the virtual set up the way it is this year. I agree. One of the other things that I'm really excited about that a lot of people don't necessarily know about are the number of community members who have been doing introductions for the films, um, who has been, who is being uh, brought in specifically to help curate our conversations during the virtual lobby. I, for one, am so excited. I just heard in a, in a different organization's meeting that we're having uh, some amazing people come in for the blue, bo blue box virtual lobby that I don't want to miss. I heard that Ken Stein is part of it, Lois Frank. I have a friend who shared with me, again, I, I found out from another organization that I volunteer with that we have a very interesting and uh, unique person who's going to be introducing the specials. And that's something that you don't want to miss. So bringing and weaving in our local community members who really have an a connection to these films and to the topics we're addressing is phenomenal. I am so looking forward to the virtual lobbies. I did not get to experience them last year because of family circumstances. And now hearing who's coming in and who's going to be curating and hosting these conversations, not to be missed. And now I'm going to watch films specifically because I know that there's a virtual lobby around it. 1618 and Zueta Island, I originally did not have those on my list, but once I heard about the conversation that's going to happen in the lobby, I'm in for both. Sari, I think you've really hit on another aspect of this whole idea of craft your own experience. You mentioned earlier the story of uh, after the film ended in the movie theater, you've been sitting in your seat for an hour and a half, two hours. Um, audiences do get antsy, and a lot of people do head for the exits before the Q&A uh, even happens. And here again, we have this phenomenal access to all these amazing film artists from around the world who want, no want nothing more than to share their story with you. Their film is nothing without an audience. And so now you don't have to necessarily watch the Q&A right after the film. If you want to take a break, kind of form your own thoughts about it, reflect on the film, come back to those Q&As at a later time during the festival. Again, virtual allows you that flexibility to continue the conversation when you're ready to do so. I think for me, I don't know about you guys, I'm most excited about watching Barry Levinson and Ben Mankiewicz talk to each other because I'm a huge Barry Levinson fan. Just love the guy, love his work, all of it. And to have that opening night film, to have him talking, I mean, we would never, I'm not saying we never would have, but it would have been a challenge to his schedule was incredibly intense to try to get him to fly in and be there at opening night to do a Q&A. I don't think it would have been easy it may not have happened but we do we we have it now and for me that's probably the most exciting part beyond the films themselves going into this festival well you know you bring up a good point which is i, I think audiences may assume a lot of these films now streaming is sort of flat in the world and you can access all these films really now at any time i don't have to go to the atlanta jewish film festival to see these movies i can i'm sure i can find them on one of these streaming services and really the beauty of AJFF is we are still curating the newest, latest, greatest in Jewish cinema. And they are, even in this streaming world, um, still films that you cannot see anywhere else. The Survivor is a great example. We'll actually have the honor of presenting the East Coast premiere of this film at the festival. The only other uh, festival I know that it has presented at is the Toronto International Festival uh, back in the fall. So, uh, yeah, don't don't wait uh, thinking that these films are going to pop up on Netflix and Hulu. They may eventually become available on other services, but 
our programming team has done such a phenomenal job of sourcing the really the newest films coming direct from the international festival circuit. These do remain films that you cannot see anywhere else and you know, presenting them in the frame of the film festival with the conversation, with the context from our amazing introductory speakers, that that's all part of the part of the uniqueness of what AJFF offers. One of the things that I love most about the film festival is that we've had all of these films curated by this host of volunteers who are fantastic, who year after year watch hundreds of films and they're presenting me with something that I wouldn't necessarily find somewhere else on the internet, but also they're challenging me. Uh, as an example, I watched the short. We've been releasing a short every Wednesday as like a way to tee up the festival. I watched a short the other day and I was on the edge of my seat. It was so well written. It was so well acted. It's not something that's going to be found on a regular streaming channel. And it reminded me why we do what we do. What we bring to people through our films and through these stories is universal, yes, but not always uh, handed to us in a way that we can process the information, that we can share it with others and really push ourselves to expand the boundaries of our world, really think differently about different spaces, different people, different communities, our history. It really makes me a better film goer by making me watch films that I might not otherwise try. And I love that about the festival. It pushes me to be a better film goer. Sari, I'm so glad you brought up the shorts because I think these are sort of the the hidden, undiscovered gems of the festival, uh, often overlooked audiences, naturally, understandably, kind of latch on to the big features. And and the shorts, um, I think there's a growing appreciation for them. But still, I would encourage listeners, if you now, again, with virtual, you have the flexibility to maybe uh, uh, take a risk, go out on a limb, try something different. Try one of the shorts programs. They're amazing because you get a little bit of everything in the span of 60 minutes or so a different mix of international filmmaking styles because it tends to be a mix of films from all corners of the world, a lot of different genres represented, a lot of different subject matter, filmmaking styles, um, all packed into these the, the most efficient storytelling and yet the same amount of impact, the same amount of emotional strength in the stories. That's the real challenge for these for these short filmmakers. And oftentimes these short filmmakers go on to then be some of our best uh, feature length filmmakers. So it's, it's a way to see kind of artists in development um, in the early part of their career and go on to become some of our preeminent, uh, preeminent uh, feature length filmmakers. That happened last year because we had Shiva Baby, which oh, we, yeah. we, we showed yeah. as a short. And then we, she took it in a Seligman went out, made it into a feature length film, was a big hit in Toronto. We showed the feature. So we, if you go on to AGFF recommends, you can find both the short and the feature length version of Shiva Baby and it's phenomenal. And I, and I have nothing, but um, I would be willing to put large sums of money on Emma Seligman having a phenomenal career uh, as she continues to evolve as a filmmaker. And that's something that, you know, Zoe Lister Jones is another filmmaker who's had enormous success as an actress, but also as a director and a writer. And I remember when she was here with her husband for um, uh, Breaking Upwards, I think was the name of the film. And it was very early in their career. I mean, it's something that that's, again, it's part of being able to be in the room and to share these experiences and to see the trajectory of these careers. That's Film Festival 101. That's the best part about a film festival, in my opinion. Absolutely. And, you know, Sari said something uh, about discovery and the, the way the festival affords this opportunity to be surprised and be challenged. And I said this with shorts, but I would say this to the listeners about the whole festival lineup. Challenge yourself. Take a risk. Do some check out a film that you might not otherwise see. I mean, absolutely find films that, you know, are going to be in your sweet spot that, you know, you're going to get a, a enrichment from. But I, I think it would be a great challenge for every one of our festival goers to look at the lineup this year, especially again with the flexibility of virtual and say, you know what, I'm going to go outside my comfort zone here. I'm going to pick a movie that really doesn't look like from the program guide description or even looking at the trailer. It doesn't seem like it would be my cup of tea, but I'm going to try it out. And I think 
one thing I salute our audience on for sure. They, I mean, we, our audience is sophisticated. They're smart. They've got great taste in movies, but I think their appreciation for film as an art form and not just escapist entertainment as so many Hollywood movies are, um, they, they've really, I think their appreciation for, for cinema has grown. And I think their tolerance for trying different kinds of films has expanded as well. I, I, I talk to audiences coming out of the theaters and if they watch something, maybe they, they didn't love it. Maybe they didn't like it as a movie, but, but often they'll say, you know what? I respect the fact that the festival programmed that film and I appreciated the chance to have seen it. And you know what? It's, it's going to leave me thinking for sure. Again, it may not have been a film that I loved or something I would normally go out and see, but I'm, I'm glad I checked it out. And I think that's again, discovery, one of the great pleasures of, any film festival, but particularly the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. I There's a lot we could probably talk about and, and don't really have time to. We could talk about the new website. We could talk about the activity booklet that you can download at ajff.org slash puzzles to play along during them. I mean, there's so many things about the festival that are great. I do want to close, though, with a question um, that I am I am actually deeply personally curious to hear both of your opinions on. This is obviously not a normal year. The year before that wasn't really normal either. The pandemic is going. I think we all have hopes that it'll turn the corner at some point soon. But do you imagine that the festival will ever, quote unquote, go back to normal? Or or is it just going to be a, a bouncing ball for the foreseeable future? And, and I mean, what do you really see for the future of the festival coming out of all of this experience the past couple of years? I'm, I'm curious what both of you think to that. Well, I think all of us here on this uh, on this conversation have learned the hard way not to try to predict the future. You know, that's OK. I think, look, filmmaking um, and film taste and filmmaking have evolved over the years. I remember when uh, VHS came out, um, Blockbuster watching movies at home, people predicted that was going to end the traditional movie going experience. And then it was DVDs. And now we have COVID. Look, there's no question events of the past two years are going to change the way we experience movies. And I think we just have to be flexible and be able to meet those moments and move with our audience. And is this going to be transient or transformational? That's the, the big question. I think it's it's really too early to tell or predict. Um, I think virtual, for all the reasons we've been talking about, does create some unique opportunities that we want to retain going going forward and retain the best of virtual for the long term. But there's no question audiences want to be back in theaters. There's something lost there that cannot be replaced with virtual. So I think we'll just have to find our way um, through that. And again, just be prepared to be open to that, to listen to our audience as we always have, uh, to utilize the new tools and the technology that we've had to sort of out of necessity uh, lean into these past two, two years. And then see where things go and be prepared to evolve with that as our industry transforms, as the movie going experience transforms, and as audience tastes and desires and audience going behaviors change as well. I can't wait to have an opening night gala again, to have us all in the theater, to have our amazing food vendors and restaurant uh, partners come together and really ce celebrate I think that people appreciate things that they haven't appreciated quite as much before. I think we're going to carry that with us. When we have an opportunity to gather, boy, are we going to have fun. When we have an opportunity to be in the theater together, boy, are we going to enjoy it. And savoring it and savoring the experiences that we are going to be able to have is what I think the future is all about. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that we're going to approach it in the best way we possibly can and make it as wonderful and as robust an experience as we can ever have. Um, but I also feel like there's a, a sweetness to everything that we are doing, especially when we're together, that we're all going to savor just a little bit more because of everything we've been through. Brad, if I may, I would love to turn the question back to you as our associate director, because you and I are throughout this past two years have been uh, constantly swapping uh, 
articles, uh, links to other podcasts, comparing notes about what is the future of our industry and different articles, different uh, thought leadership has resonated with us at different times and other times not. So curious, um, as you and I have been reflecting on this over the past uh, couple of years and what is the future for film festivals, where do you come down on this question? You know, I, I think you can't, I think you'd be naive and I think you'd be willfully sticking your head in the stand if if you think that the film industry isn't evolving and changing at, at, a, at a very fast clip. And that means that the film festival world is, is changing too. I mean, this was before the pandemic. I mean, the, the Netflixes of the world and the, and the shift to streaming is something that really predates COVID. And I think that to try to imagine a world where the movie going experience in theaters looks exactly like it did in the 90s, in the early aughts, and that's just not reality, and unfortunately. I mean, I miss it. Uh, I grew up going to the movies all the time. I grew up with a, a, a crap ton, pardon me, <laughs> just of theaters in my uh, town and could go see all sorts of different kinds of films. I look at my son, he's three. I don't want him to watch all of his movies on an iPad, but you know, the world is what it is and change is the constant. Now, that being said, I do think that... Um, it ultimately does come down to storytelling and, and filmmaking and the kinds of films that you see at film festivals, uh, the kinds of films that you see at this film festival, that, that's, a, that's a kind of flavor of storytelling that you're not going to necessarily get at the big blockbuster multiplex kind of um, every week world that everybody kind of lives with the, the full of Marvel films and action and adventure. And, you know, you, you, you see some of those films on the Netflixes and the Amazon primes, but even there, uh, I don't think you see it in the volume. I don't think you see a lot of this stuff. And as you said, Kenny, a lot of it doesn't never makes it to those streaming platforms and there's still an audience for that. And they're going to have to maybe go out of their way a little bit, but I think our audience has always gone out of their way a little bit that they've gone out of their way to support us. They've gone out of our way to show up and to bring their friends. I mean, our growth over the past 22 years has been fueled by word of mouth, um, has always been fueled by word of mouth. And I've always been very proud of the enthusiasm because it's one thing to sort of show up yourself, but to bring your friends, to bring your family and to say, this is something that I'm so excited about. And I want to share it with you. So I don't think that's going to go away. Um, do I think we'll be back in theaters? I do. Do I think that theaters will all look the same? I don't. Do I think there will be as many theaters? No. But there will always be dark rooms with projections, projectionists and, and film projectors in the back of them and really awesome speakers. And if, even if we have to build it ourselves, I think we will do that. That's, that's, our, that's just how passionately we feel as a film festival, as an organization about the power of not just film, but the power of film and, and theater going to level the playing field and create a safe space. Everybody goes to the movies. You may not go to the same churches or synagogues or mosques. Uh, you may not have the same political beliefs, but everybody goes to the movies. Um, and I do think that's that's a reality that has enormous power to, to bridge differences and to get people to get out of their own heads, their own experiences, and to really step into a place of empathy. And do I think we'll also be in your living rooms? Yes, I do. Do I also think we're going to be in your ear holes with this podcast and with other things? Yes, I do. I think for us as an organization, the future is about being flexible and dynamic and growing the ways that we reach you with, with Jewish storytelling and with our mission, which is to, to use that storytelling to get us to be more understanding of each other and our differences and our similarities, regardless of how we affiliate, regardless of how we identify ourselves. I don't think that's going to go away, but I do think the exciting thing for me is that the way in which we deliver it will be broader than it's ever been and more accessible than it's ever been. So for me, I'm very optimistic about the future, but you know, I can't help but take a moment to lament you know, the ways in which the industry has changed over the past 10 or 20 years um, that you know, it will continue to change. That's just the way the world works. That's the way the world spins. So I'm, I'm okay with it. I think you got to take the good with the bad. Hey, our audience has been with us on this journey with uh, learning to appreciate subtitles, silent films. We've had black and white. We've had animation. We have even had a 3D film. I know eventually we'll have something on virtual reality. So who knows what is coming next, but I know our audience is bold, adventurous, and will be on that journey with us. 
Well, I want to not take up any more of your time. We are we aren't actually at the festival yet, so we do have work to do to get ready. Um, but I do want to thank uh, both of you, Sari and Kenny, again for joining me today for this podcast. It's always Brad, a pleasure, Brad. Most of all, I want to thank uh, our listeners uh, who have joined us with this podcast for going on two years now. This podcast has been a labor of love for a number of people, from myself and my original co-host, Sarah Glassberg, to Chris Holland, who produces every episode and sits in the recording booth and sits in the editing bay, to the many other staff members and interns and guests who've helped make this what it has been. One of those people is the incomparable Joe Alterman, whose incredible piano skills have created the music you've heard and are hearing in this episode and in every episode that we have had of this podcast. Please, we encourage you to go seek him out whenever and wherever you get your music. This podcast will return with some changes in the spring. Uh, it will not sound exactly the same, um, but it will, I think, sound very familiar to those who have been along for uh, the ride with us. Uh, until then, however, we have a genuine classic of a film festival in just a week. I hope you will enjoy some of the 50 plus films over the course of this February. May you be safe, may you be healthy, and may you be wildly entertained by the best in Jewish cinema at the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. Goodbye.